Yeah, broadly, noncompliance was a big part of the research, uh, and we know that um, from Kavanaugh and Danielle Robertson's paper, 80% of patients are consistently noncompliant, and probably 100% of us who wear contact lenses are compliant in some fashion when you look at all the steps to contact lens wear. But, you know, wearing time is an issue, lens replacement schedule, using expired solution in lenses. Uh, we talked about topping off, but uh, and also the lens case issue. So, yeah, I mean, I think the abuses out there are numerous. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the In Focus podcast series. I'm Andrew Pucker. I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Medical Sciences at Lexitas Pharma Services. And today we're joined by our expert, Joe. Joe, could you please give us a little background about who you are and um, why we're talking about a paper today? Sure, Andrew, Joe Shovlin. I'm in a group practice in Northeastern Pennsylvania in Scranton, and we're a group of 36, a uh, good number of ophthalmologists and the rest optometrists. And we are pretty much a referral center for all of Northeastern PA. Perfect. So today we're here to discuss a very important paper from the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society. Specifically, this is from their lifestyle report with the specific sub-report titled Impact of Contact Lenses on the Ocular Surface. Joe, could you give us a little overview of that paper and why it's important to the field? Happy to. Um, just to back up just for a moment, TFOS is the tear film locker surface group who is really world leader in eye health education. And uh, they're well known for their definitions of dry eye with dues one, dues two. And an, re and an update that we anticipate in the near future. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to be part of a group of 17 individuals worldwide. I think if I have the count right, it was about eight different countries. Uh, three of us from the US, um, Deb Jacobs, Melissa Barnett, and myself, um, a very talented group and just felt very fortunate to uh, be part of this whole group. Um, I think I have the count right. I think there were 600 and over 600 references, 668 to be exact, I believe. 155 pages. Uh, first glance, it may look like it's a cure for insomnia, but there's a lot of good information <laughs> in this report. Um, there are really two specific areas that we highlighted. One is looking at evidence-based information on contact lens choices that impact the ocular surface. And number two, specifically lifestyle choices that one makes, individual wearers make, impacting contact lens wear and success. Yeah, monumental undertaking. I'm on the political, or sorry, the public awareness committee for TFOS, and I read every paper. It probably took me a week, literally like a work week, to read these, but there's great knowledge in there. So, um, what were some of the interesting things we learned about, for example, topping off contact lens solutions during this literature search? Yeah, we we look at uh, two broad areas. One is unsafe practices, which would certainly include topping off lens solutions. We learned a few lessons with Fusarium way back when with Renew with Moisture Lock and uh, topping off solutions is not a good idea because of the decrease in efficacy, especially as it relates to antimicrobial activity, specifically antifungal activity. Uh, case replacement, a lot of bad things happen in the case. That's where bugs sequester over time. And getting rid of that case specifically every two to three months is ideal. A um, couple other areas would be, you know, the time-honored question, is it safe to wear contact lenses overnight? And Nothing really comes close. Everything else pales in comparison to overnight wear as it relates to microbial keratitis. Tap water rinses, taboo. Um, we could debate that at social hour. It's always been the dogma <laughs> with rigid lenses, but uh, not a good idea to expose your lenses to tap water. And of course, swimming with contact lenses has been a hot topic over the last decade or more. So it sounds like it kind of reaffirmed some of the things we already knew, um, or we thought we knew, but really just put it all together in one spot for us. Absolutely. Um, another kind of topic I think that was in this paper was related to wear schedules. So we know there's daily disposables, there's two week, one month lens wear schedules. What did they find was probably the safest of those that we have available to us? Yeah, broadly, noncompliance was a big part of the 
research uh, and we know that um, from Kavanaugh and Danielle Robertson's paper, 80% of patients are consistently non-compliant and probably 100% of us who wear contact lenses are compliant in some fashion when you look at all the steps to contact lens wear. But you know, wearing time is an issue, lens replacement schedule, using expired solution in lenses. Uh, we talked about topping off, but uh, and also the lens case issue. So yeah, I mean, I think the abuses out there are numerous. Um, the beauty of, let's say, daily disposable lenses is that you avoid case storage storage case issues for contamination. Uh, it's really affordable these days, uh, wonderful for kids, and we really reduce the risk of severe complications. If you do have an infection, it's usually with a gram positive bug rather than gram negative, and I'd much rather have a gram positive bug than a gram negative bug in most cases. And then uh, the less likely to sleep in contact lenses and adherence to replacement schedule is, is key, not to mention the convenience of daily disposables which are numerous. I love that Robert's paper, Robertson paper. It's like mm -hmm. what one person in the 200 and some people in the study actually did every step correctly. Yes, yeah, I think, it, <laughs> I don't know how many steps there were, I forget whether it was 23 or something like that. But yeah, there are folks that are OCD, that are very compulsive. We like those patients. Yeah, they can wear contact lenses all the time, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, another, topic that was really important, especially when this paper was written, was related to COVID and getting sick. So what did the paper find related to wearing contact lenses and having a cold? Yeah, interesting. Uh, we were involved very heavily at the Academy with uh, COVID and making recommendations. And we had a little bit of a struggle with ophthalmology. You initially said you can't wear your contact lenses, but you know, with the work of um, Linda Jones and, and uh, Nichols and Wilcox and others, uh, really there's, you know, if you're not unwell, if you're healthy and you don't have a fever, uh, typically contact lens wear was deemed appropriate because you're really not touching your face as much as you would with glasses in, in most cases. So, but with COVID, there are mask issues that we have um, with, you know, uh, potential contamination, whether it's viral or bacterial, uh, most of these are viral anyway, but uh, coughing, sneezing, people not washing their hands. And I think even though it's the evidence that we looked at was somewhat inconclusive for infection, uh, there's no question there was a link uh, with corneal inflammatory events uh, to the point that it was, I believe it's a three and a half, almost a three and a half times greater relative risk of developing infiltrative keratitis uh, in patients who wore lenses during cold or flu-like illness. And I think the key component there would be potential for contamination to the ocular surface, people, people being lazy, not washing their hands. And uh, those are all important issues, especially if somebody is unwell. I think that all makes sense. You know, you're sick, take out your contact lenses. And that side paper that you mentioned from Lyndon Jones at all suggested that really COVID's not going to make your chances of getting eye infection worse. It's just like with any cold, you take off your contact lenses. This makes sense, yeah. Yeah. The other issue we looked at too was just wearing the lenses during allergies. Uh, I know mm. at least in Northeastern PA, we go through this cycle springtime, we have tree pollen, in the summer we have grasses, and in the fall until we have a couple good frosts, we have ragweed or, or weeds. So daily disposable lenses make sense. Um, you're tossing those things. It's you don't have that occlusive patch test uh, over time, uh, and reduce wearing time as well is also helpful. And we always say that dry eyes make allergies worse. Allergies make dry <laughs> eyes worse. That's quite the cycle. So, um, well, I know this paper was in depth and long. As you said, there was something like 600 references. Are there any other key take home points you want to leave our listeners before we head out? Yeah, I think that targeted prevention that may help practitioners. I think there'll be some posters just like CDC did a few years ago. Very helpful to help practitioners to educate patients. Uh, I think at the very end of the paper, there's a long systematic review uh, looking at dropouts, which is still about 25% at two to three years, much higher in presbyopic wares. Uh, and this meta-analysis really carved things down to 34 eligible studies. 
Uh, and the conclusion is we need more research. We need to examine these lifestyle factors associated with lens dropout. And I think that'll be very helpful. So um, we're looking at the gaps in education, gaps in research. And I think we've identified some additional questions that would be important to assure our patients that they have safe and effective contact lens wear. That's kind of the beauty of these papers. They kind of just set the stage for what we should do for the next 10 years for research and help guide us with practice. Absolutely. So, so with that, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. And I'd also like to thank, of course, Joe for being our guest. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.